Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. Your Bible here, say it with me. This is my Bible. It's God's infallible word. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have, and I can do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the word of God. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive, and I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Job chapter 1, then ver- the very first verse of Job. It says, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God, and he shunned evil. Father, I pray for your anointing over your word. God, that your will is done here today. God, that what you want spoken is spoken. What you want received is received. And God, what you want to accomplish is accomplished. God, as your people, we need to listen to you. We talk to you a lot, and we tell you a lot what we want, but God, we need to stop and be silent and let you speak to our heart today so that we know that you know what's going on in our life and that we know which direction we need to take. We need to know when we need to take a step, and we know when we need to turn away. But Father, I pray today that ultimately your will is done in absolutely everything that happens in this building. From the youngest child in the nursery through the junior church, to the service here in the sanctuary. Might you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. You and I, as Americans, want comfort. One of the things that we did when uh, we were picking out seats for this new sanctuary is we had different uh, companies come in, and they brought in samples of their chairs. And we did a few things with that. One, I sat on it to see if it was strong enough. That wasn't funny, was it? (laughs) I had Pastor Christy, you know, she goes out with the kids. She kind of blends in with them because she's not very tall. I had her set on them to make sure her feet could touch the floor. (laughs) So here's the thing. If you're breaking the chair down or your feet don't touch the floor, (laughs) you're in worse shape than we were. Uh, No, we we tried to get something that would be comfortable, something that would fit. See, we as Americans, we are good Americans because we are into comfortable. If we buy furniture for our home, we might want that furniture to look nice, but we also want it to be comfortable. We we not only want to know how it sits, but if you're from my house, you want to know how it sleeps. We put in a a room here a couple of years ago when we bought some new living room furniture for it, and everything that we bought reclines. Our living room sleeps eight. You don't believe me? Come over in the afternoon sometime. If we buy a car, we want it to be comfortable. If we buy a bed, we want that bed to be comfortable. We are into comfort, and because of that, a lot of us are now built for comfort, right? There's nothing wrong with wanting to be comfortable that, to, to some degree. That's our nature. But at the same time, we've somehow convinced ourselves that we shouldn't ever have to suffer any discomfort. We have a zero tolerance for discomfort. We don't want to feel any pain. We don't want any struggles. We don't want any trials. We don't want any challenges. We just want everything in our life to be easy. But if we have any sense at all, we know that is not reality. Not everything in life is easy. If you're looking for a place where you can go where you won't have to face any trials and you won't have to deal with any challenges, then you best start digging your grave because as long as you are living and as long as you are breathing, life is not always going to be easy. Can I get an amen? My brother-in-law texted me one day. He said, Pastor, I was sure he was being sarcastic. He said, Pastor, I need some advice. Last night my pipes froze. My furnace stopped working and now my truck won't start. What do you think God is trying to tell me? So I answered him sarcastically. I said, I think God's telling you to insulate your pipes, buy a new furnace, and trade in your truck. 
you'll probably never ask me for spiritual advice again. Don't try to spiritualize everything that happens to you. If your car breaks down, it's probably not the devil. It might just be because you bought a lemon or you didn't take care of the car that you had. If money is tight, it's not the enemy buffeting you, but it's probably because you live in an economy where your income hasn't caught up with your outgo. Don't spiritualize everything. You got the flu because somebody sneezed on you at work and not because the devil was trying to kill you. Don't try to spiritualize everything that happens to you. We live in a cursed world and under the curse of Adam's sin. And not everything is going to be right. Not everything will be good. Not everything will go your way. But don't give the devil credit when credit is not due. Don't glorify Satan for something that Satan hasn't done. We'll all agree that there are far too many troubles in this life. We'll agree that there are too many trials and there is too much sickness and there's too much death and there are too many financial worries and too much persecution. But we also know that even though we don't want to experience these things, they're still a natural part of this life. Life is filled with highs and lows. There are good days and there are also bad days. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that there is a time and a season for everything under the sun. We live in a sin-cursed world where death reigns. This is not heaven. This isn't paradise. So you and I are subject to the fallout of Adam's sin. But because of these things that we sometimes, we sometimes find uh, ourselves uh, seeking relief, we, we, are, we are not only seeking relief from what's going on, but we are also worrying and fretting about what might happen next. Who's feeling guilty right now? Let me give you some real good advice. Don't deal with a problem that you don't have. Don't deal with a problem that you don't have. There are enough real troubles that we don't have the time to waste worrying about what might be. It doesn't matter if it is a potential problem or if it might happen or if it's happened to somebody else when they were in your shoes. If it hasn't happened to you yet, then don't worry about it. Have you ever been around somebody who worries about things that haven't yet gone wrong? Maybe you are one. We humans have a tendency to look on the dark side. We're bent toward the negative. We go to the doctor and the doctor says, I'm going to have to run a test. Or I'm going to have to do a biopsy, and before the test is ever run, or the biopsy is ever taken, our mind shifts into fear mode, and we begin thinking in terms of our own mortality. Before the doctor ever leaves our side to begin his work, we take out our shovel and we start digging our grave. He's drawing blood, and we're making funeral arrangements. He's reading our test results, and we're reading our insurance policy. The nurse is scheduling our next appointment, and we're chiseling our tombstone. Don't deal with a problem that you don't have. There are enough real troubles to occupy your time without wasting your days worrying about something that has not yet happened. Life is too short to spend it worrying about things that might be. Let me tell you something. If you are so problem-free that you can afford to squander your time worrying about things that don't exist, God says in Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Think about these things. If you want to dwell on something, then dwell on something good. If you have to stop, then stop and smell the roses uh, or, or stop and listen to the music. Enjoy the life that God has given to you and the people that he has put in your life and the blessings that he has poured out on you one precious moment at a time. You don't have time to waste. Now, we all know that calamity might come. But until it does, take pleasure in the blessings that God has already given to you. And even if tragedy does come, don't let it monopolize your time or steal your blessing or silence your joy or restrain your praise, but seek out the good that God has surrounded you with and then dwell on those things. Worrying has never helped anybody. Getting depressed and angry has never done one ounce of good. You can worry about your bills, but worry won't pay your bills, and it will never make you any more money. You can worry about what other people think about you, but worrying won't make you any new friends. You can worry about your health, but worry will only make you sick. You can worry about the valley that you're walking through, but if you ever decide to take a break from your worrying and, and, and where you're walking and look up, 
Oh, somebody, somebody pay attention here. If you look up and see your God who is bigger than your problem, your God who is richer than your debt, your God who is more powerful than your enemies, if you can look up and see your God who is in control of everything and everybody at all times and then dwell on the good things, somebody needs to hear this this morning, you will soon find out that all things work together for the good to those who love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Personal suffering is a natural part of this life. It happens to everybody at some time or another. Some of you are going through that right now. You might be sick or you might have a family member who's fighting a physical battle with cancer or heart disease or something else. You might have recently walked through the valley of death's shadow and have lost somebody that's close to you. Or maybe you're struggling and no matter how much you bail water, your boat is still sinking. Whatever it is, it has either happened to you or is it about to happen to you because personal suffering is a natural part of this life. But Christian, I want you to know something this morning. The divine deliverance of God is a part of this life too. Your story is not over. No matter what you're facing, no matter what the trial, no matter how dark the valley, uh, your God is always in control and there's absolutely nothing that can touch you that does not pass through him first. Your God, who is in control of your trial, has a plan. He has a plan, and he has made a path for you to follow that will lead you to where you would want to be if you knew what God knew. God knows you. He knows what you're made of even when you don't know what you're made of. And because he knows you intimately, he has numbered your steps, and he's charted your course, and he has a victory waiting for you at the finish line. So you need to get up and finish. There's nothing that you're going to face that will destroy you because God said, I built you to live forever. There's no weapon formed against you that's going to do you in because God has made you invincible to the weapons of the enemy because he is your refuge and he is your fortress. In him is your strength and his strength is made perfect when you are weak. Somebody asked me, Pastor, where is the scripture that says God won't allow us to go through more than we can handle? I said, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful that he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll provide a way that you can endure it. But that is a scripture about temptation. It's not a scripture about trials. The truth is there are many things that come against you that you will not be able to handle on your own. There are many challenges that are beyond your strength and your ability. That's why you need the Lord. Nobody is so strong or so spiritual that they can handle adversity by themselves. We all need God's help. We all need somebody who is bigger and stronger and more powerful than the trials that we'll face. Listen to me this morning. Those of you who need to be encouraged. Those of you who are depressed, those of you who are weary, you might be at the end of your rope, but tie a knot in it and hold on because God is still God and you will see victory. And do you know why? Do you know why? Because we know something. We know something. The Bible says we know. And if the Bible says we know, what did I tell you to do? Underline it. Because it's something God wants you to know. We know that all things work together for good. We know that the good things work together for good. And we know that the bad things work together for good. And we know that the unimportant things aren't unimportant at all because everything is a part of God's master plan. And all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And all means all all and that's all all means. We're going to get a t-shirt made up that says that. You might, you'll buy 10. All right, there, first order. You might be struggling, but don't quit now because God is preparing you for an opportunity where he can show off through you. You need encouragement. When you're down or fighting a battle, you don't need somebody reminding you how bad you look and how difficult things are. Don't you just hate it when people do that? You don't need somebody sharing war stories of how other people have fought a battle like yours and they lost. You need some good news. Now, I've been accused over the years of being uncaring because when I visit the hospital, I rarely talk to the patient about their sickness. 
That's why everybody, that's what everybody else says. Everybody that walks through the door of your hospital room says the same things. How you feeling? What did the doctor tell you? How long do you have left? (laughs) After you've answered those questions 20 or 30 times, you feel worse than you did before you had company. But God doesn't send me to your hospital room to enhance your sickness. I am the distraction. I am the distraction. I'm there to take your mind off of your problem and help you focus on God so you can dwell on good things and keep your trial in perspective. Speak positive words. Speak words of life. Don't rehash the problem. Don't analyze the situation. Don't try to figure it out so that it all makes sense, but speak words of life to your situation. What does the old song say? Speak them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Say something good or don't say anything at all. When we face trials, there's one question that's primary. It's not what is the solution? Or how can I get out of this mess? Or where can I find relief? Those are secondary questions. But the primary question that we all want an answer to is why? Why? And God, in his divine wisdom, says to us, have you considered my servant Job? Have you considered Job? Have you considered Job? Before you tried figuring it out, have you considered Job? Before you panic, have you considered Job? Before you go all crazy with fear and anger and blow up on the people around you, have you considered Job? I like where this is going. Back in 1998, there was a young lady in our congregation named Wanda. I'd known Wanda nearly all of my life. She was a neighbor of ours. She was a year or two older than me. And we rode the same bus to school every day. Wanda was always put together. Ever since I knew her, even as a kid growing up, she was always put together. As kids, we were just who we were. She's sitting on the school bus with her books sitting beside her, her hands in her lap. She's all dressed. Her hair's calm. We're jumping over the seats. But she was always put together. In 1992, she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And she wasn't expected to live. And if she did survive the surgery on her tumor, she was probably not going to ever be able to speak again. But when she came out of the surgery and they were taking her to the recovery room, she was talking to the surgeon. The surgeon, this professional man that makes a lot of money, is very intelligent, did something I've never seen a surgeon do before. He was jumping up and down and clapping his hands like a little kid. He couldn't believe it. She made a full recovery. Now, patients are typically told if they can make it five years without a reoccurrence, they would probably be out of the woods. Four years and 11 months later, Wanda began to have headaches. Her tumor returned, but this time it came back with a vengeance. I went to visit her one day, and she was having a good day as good days were measured during her illness. That day, we had one of our longest and our most special conversations we'd ever had. On most of our conversations, they would be trivial. I'd ask her about her life, and she would then tell me about her kids and uh, about the things that we're involved in and how good her husband was. She would tell me about other people's needs and how bad off they were and then advise me that it really wasn't necessary for me to drive all the way over to see her when I had so many important things to do. We'd talk about new medications and prayer meetings, holding on to the last thread of hope that God would again answer our prayers and heal her like he did five years earlier. But this visit was different. It was as though the Holy Spirit had sealed the room off from everybody. The phone didn't ring. Nobody came to the door. And I sat by her bed, and I shared with her the store, the lesson that I had taught at Bible study the night before. It was a story of Job, and the question was, why do righteous people suffer? It was in the middle of our conversation that Wanda's guard came down. Her strong, composed, always in control personality fell away. And there, hurt and confused and trying to understand why, Wanda listened as I told her the story of Job. When I had finished and it was time to pray, we usually prayed for strength and healing, but this time I asked her, I said, what do you want me to pray for? And she said, pray for something good. Pray for something good. I took her by the hand and we began to pray, and as we prayed, she released her trust completely in Jesus, that, whom she loved and served, knowing, as 2 Corinthians 4, 8 says, that even though she was troubled on every side, she was not distressed. 
Even though she was perplexed, she wasn't in despair. Even though persecuted, she was never forsaken. Cast down, but she was not going to be destroyed. When we finished praying, she looked me square in the eyes and she said, this is my Job. This is my Job. We can learn a lot from Job. Job was a brilliant example of a child of God. In Job 1.1, God describes him as perfect and upright, a man that loved God and hated evil. There aren't many people in the world like Job. There never has been. Job was spotless in the eyes of God who sees all and knows all. He was devoutly religious. Not only was serving God in his house for himself, but Job 1.5 says that daily he prayed and he sacrificed interceding for his children so that they too would be right with God. Outwardly, Job was loved and respected by everybody. Chapter 29 says that young men would see him and step aside. Old men would see him and they would rise to their feet. The voices of the nobles and the leaders would remain silent so that everybody could hear what he had to say. He rescued the poor. He helped the orphans. He comforted the dying. He sustained the widows. He was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame and a father to the needy and a defender of the defenseless. Inwardly, Job was at peace with God and himself. He carried no guilty conscience. There were no skeletons in his closet. There were no secret sins to be found out. But Job was everything that a child of God should be, and God noticed Job. Does God ever notice you? Is the way that you're living and what you are doing for his kingdom so critical and so special that God looks directly at you and wells up with pride? Job 1.6 says that there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also in among them. The devil's always looking for an opportunity to slip through the door and get in where he's not welcome. He's looking for an opportunity to get into the church. He's looking for an opportunity to get into your home and an opportunity to get into your business. But God noticed the devil sitting in the back row. God knew why the devil was there. And he called out and he said, hey. Have you noticed my servant, Job? There's none like him in all of the earth. He's a perfect and upright man. He fears me and he hates evil. And the devil said, oh yeah, I've noticed him. Satan questioned Job's sincerity. He said, God, Job's only serving you because he has it so good. He's rich, he's healthy, he has a good marriage and a great family, and everybody's his friend. But you take that hedge down that you build around him, you take the hedge down that keeps me away from him and afflict him, and he'll curse you to your face. Now, you know the story. God who knows everything, God who knows the end from the beginning, God who knows way more than the devil ever thought of knowing, took down the hedge, and Satan attacked all that Job had. He killed his children, he stole his riches, he robbed him of his friends, and he cursed his body with boils. And yet through it all, the Bible says that Job remained faithful to God. He did not sin or charge God foolishly. And God once again said to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? A perfect and upright man. He still fears me and he still hates evil and he still holds fast to his integrity, even though you have moved against him to destroy him without reason without reason. Let's dwell on this a little bit. The human mind is designed to solve problems. When we were in school and the math teacher would ask two plus four equals, we would automatically be calculating the answer in our minds and we would go six. But when we got a little older, the problems became more complex. Instead of using simple numbers, the teacher would use X's and Y's. She would say X plus Y equals 6, and then she would ask, how much is X? And what we do? We'd freak out. Teacher, we can't tell you what X is unless we know what Y is. We need more information. And so are the trials of life. We often ask God why, not because knowing why will make us feel better, not because knowing why will make our problem go away, but because we have become convinced that if we know why, then we will be able to solve the problem on our own. When the equation of life equals suffering, when the equation of life equals death, we believe that if we know why, we can subtract the why from the result and solve the equation of this unnecessary suffering. But you see, God wanted Job to know that knowing why wasn't important. 
but knowing him was the solution for all of the trials of life. God said, Job, trust me, I am God. We may never know why, but we have to trust the providence of our God who loves us with an unfathomable love. Proverbs 35, 6 says, Trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Life can sometimes be very difficult all by itself. There are schedules and deadlines and bills to pay and obligations to meet, and life can be hard. But then you're a Christian and you add to it all of the spiritual aspects and all of the battles that we have to face in the spirit realm and life becomes even more difficult. I fight battles every day. I'm a Christian and I've been a pastor for over 30 years, but I am also just a man and I am not immune. If you want me to be perfect, then you're just going to have to leave and go somewhere else. I will never be perfect until the day I die. I fight battles just like you do. I fight battles with temptation. I fight battles with anger. I fight battles with depression. I fight battles with fear and with worry. I spend hours awake in the middle of the night. It seems that there is a battle going on somewhere in my life 24-7. Sometimes I lose one or two of those battles. Sometimes the enemy gets the best of me and I fail. Sometimes I get weary or sometimes I get careless and I'm wounded. But when I'm wounded, the enemy doesn't stop. He never stops. Because when I'm wounded, it's then that he tries to finish me off and the attacks get even stronger. But where is God in all of this? I thought God was supposed to protect me and supply for my needs. I thought God was supposed to bless me for the good that I do and keep me from the unfairness of this world. Sometimes I'm overwhelmed because I feel as though God has completely forsaken me and failed to be the God that he promised he would be. Can you identify I was having one of those moments a couple of weeks ago. My body was tired. My spirit was weary. And I didn't have any fight left in my fight. My spiritual logic was tainted because I got to the place where it was all beyond my strength and all beyond my ability, and I was overwhelmed. Are you ever overwhelmed? Are there days when you can't seem to handle the things that you've handled before? Are there times when your body is weak and your spirit's weary and there's no fight left in your fight? Are there moments when everything that you're carrying becomes so heavy for you that you collapse beneath the weight of the load? I snapped on God. I'm ashamed to admit it. Had to repent for doing it. I've been a Christian long enough and I pastored long enough and preached God's word long enough that I should have known better. I know that God's word's true. I know that God loves me. I know that he's my provider. I know that he's my protector. I know that he'll never leave me or forsake me. But for a brief moment, I forgot all of that, and I snapped on God. Have you ever done that? It all came pouring out. I couldn't hold it back. I couldn't restrain it. Luke 6.45 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. God already knew it was in my heart, but it came out in my mouth. And my mouth spoke. I said, God, I feel like you've forsaken me. I've given my life to do your will and to build your kingdom. I work seven days a week. I do everything you ask me to do, but you don't protect me and you don't help me. There was a brief silence. And then the Holy Spirit of God spoke to me just as plainly as I'm speaking to you. God said, Satan wants to kill you and I won't allow him. But the things that are happening to you are what I have permitted him to do. This is your Job. That's where this sermon came from. This is your Job. See, God had been doing his job all along. God had never left me. He hadn't forsaken me. If the devil had his way, I'd be dead. But God draws the line between his children and the enemy. God decides how far he's going to let the devil go. God decides how much freedom Satan has in our life. But what God decides has a divine purpose. In his divine wisdom, our wonderful God, who already knows the future, who is in control of all things and all people at all times, has charted our path through enemy territory to accomplish the mission he has assigned to us. This is your Job. There's a riddle that asks, what has six feet, three noses, can run like a deer, fly like an eagle, and yet has never been tamed by man? The answer is, there's no answer. 
It's total nonsense. When given the riddle of suffering, our minds tend to go into warp speed. We compute and analyze and reason to try to solve the riddle. We call specialists, we read books, we try old-fashioned remedies, we search the Internet, we gamble on a long shot, and when we're unable to come up with a real solution, we get frustrated and irritated and aggravated, and we're no longer able to focus because we don't know where else to look. It's then that we overreact. We're God's child, but we act out of character. We do or say things that we wouldn't ordinarily say or do. Job, with with his wealth gone, his children dead, his body in decay, and his wife surrendering to defeat, arrived at this point. It was Job's breaking point. His personal strength was gone. His spirit was exhausted. His wisdom was inadequate. And Job, the great man that he was, was ready to give up. And he snapped on God. How often have you heard, if there's a God... Or if God is love, then why is is this happening? Why doesn't he do something about it? What we're really saying there is, God, you owe me an explanation. We teach our children that with goodness comes reward and with evil comes consequences. But when that philosophy becomes our rigid line for defining all of the experiences of life, we have a tendency to develop a shallow conceit and we set ourselves up for a miserable fall. Job demanded an answer. We are unitary beings, meaning that all of our parts act as one. When our body suffers, our mind and our emotions and our spirit life are also affected. Job had lost his health, but Job's problem wasn't a physical one. Job could make sense of his calamities, but his problem wasn't a mental one. Job's trouble was spiritual. Not meaning that Job had sin in his life, but Job had a perspective problem. You see, Job held onto his faith, but Job somehow felt that the things he was going through had separated him from God. Job felt that God no longer loved him, that God no longer cared, and that God had abandoned him. We're emotional beings. We know that when we feel good, we feel good. And when we feel bad, we feel bad. But our relationship with God has absolutely nothing to do with how we feel. There may be days when you don't feel saved, but it doesn't change your relationship with God. Job finally snapped, and he demanded an answer from God, and God said to him, I love this, Job, gird up your loins. Basically, what God said to him, Job, yank your pants up. We're going to talk. Be careful when you ask God for an answer. God answered Job's question with 82 questions of his own. Job said, God, I got a question. And God said, I got a test. 82 questions. And you know how Job answered all 82 of God's questions? Job said, I don't know. Job, football quarterback was barred from playing in the big game because he had cheated on a test. His coach was angry and he confronted the teacher And the teacher said he sat next to the smartest kid in the class and he copied all of his answers. The coach said, how do you know that my quarterback cheated? And the teacher said on question number six, the smartest kid in the class wrote for an answer, I don't know. On question number six, your quarterback wrote, me either. (laughs) Why did God ask Job so many questions? He did it to show Job that even with all of his experience, and all of his wisdom, and all of his ability, and all of his accomplishment, that there was more than one thing in life that he did not and could never understand. Maybe that's where you are right now. You feel like you're no longer being protected by God's hedge. You feel like the hedge has dropped, and you are now, the enemy is just free to attack you. And the enemy has mercilessly and relentlessly attacked you, and you're now in this valley of despair, and you're wondering where God is. Well, maybe, just maybe, This is your Job. We will all have a Job moment at some time in our life. We'll all face a problem that is bigger than we are, an an unclimbable mountain, a devastating valley, or insurmountable odds. But God knows where we are. He always knows where we are. He knows what we're facing. He knows the battles that we fight, and he knows the weaknesses and our limitations. But God also knows what we are capable of even when we don't know. He knows our strengths and the power that's in us that we have never used. He knows of our untapped potential. He knows how he has fearfully and wonderfully made us. So God has assigned to us battles that he knows we can win. So our life might bring him the most glory. This is our Job. 
God who knows the end from the beginning has choreographed our journey through life to fulfill his divine purpose in us so that when the day in eternity the future comes, he might be able to say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of the Lord. This is my beloved son, or this is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. You've remained faithful to me through the tests of life. You stood strong in the face of adversity. You fought a good fight. You finished the course, and you've kept the faith. And now there's laid up for you a crown of righteousness, which I, the Lord, the righteous judge, shall award to you personally. This is your Job. This trial that you're facing, the valley that you're walking through, this fight that you're in, it's your job. It's not your time to suffer, but it's your moment to shine. So get back up on your feet. Wipe the tears from your eyes and the sweat from your brow. Dust the dirt from your knees. Arch your back and hold your head up high. Because this is your job. And God, who knows how it's going to end, knows that you can do it. You can do it. Father, I pray today that these words will be encouragement to those who have been discouraged by life. Yeah, there are a lot of problems in this world. The longer this world goes, the worse it gets. And Father, I pray that some way, somehow, that we'll understand that you've never left our side. You're still here. Everything still matters. You still love us like you've always loved us. You still have a plan. Nothing's gotten out of line. Nothing is out of order. Nothing's out of your control. But it's all in the palm of your hand. Father, I pray that you'll encourage your people, especially those who right now are enduring their own joy. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God, or to receive a copy of Rev. James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103, or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.